and today we're going to talk about administrative remedy. Administrative remedy is writing paperwork without going to court. So you only go to court to settle uh, arguments that you can't settle out of court. You know, the Bible says, you know, you know, fix the problems between you and your brother while you're in the way with him before he drags you to court. So we're going to discuss administrative remedy, which is sending in documentation to get agreements handled without argument. First, we have to have an idea of what are the rules we are working under, or in other words, the law that applies to our commerce or business. Where did commerce come from? People have been doing commerce or business since time began. The Ten Commandments are basically rules of law that apply to the tribe or community for efficient transaction of, in business and to have the, the tribe or community continue to be in existence. So we all know, I mean, it, are we going to live as a community and not have rules like thou shalt not kill you know, or thou shalt not steal? If you go to your California assembly person's office and get a copy of the California Constitution of 1879, and I'm going to show you a copy, my copy right here, in it, it starts off with a complete transcription of the Magna Carta of 1215 AD and moves on to the Mayflower Compact of 1620, the Declaration of Rights of 1774, the Declaration of Independence of 1776, the Articles of Confederation, of 1778 and the United States Constitution of 1787. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which was our agreement with Spain, and finally the Constitution of the State of California of 1879. The first California Constitution was signed in 1849, so we see that the law is handed down from 1215 Magna Carta, where common law originated. Under common law, Everyone has a right to seek punishment against someone who has injured them, and no legislative laws apply because this is only one law. Quote, do unto others that which you would not like done unto you. It's simple, the golden rule. The rules of doing business are that you have to have all the elements of a lawful contract to be valid. What are the elements of a lawful contract? One, there has to be a meeting of the minds or full disclosure because it is assumed that no one would want to be deceived in a deceitful way in a contract that didn't purport to give him the results he was bargaining for. An example would be if Pete was watching, was watching Jim wash his brand new Toyota and Jim tells Pete he needs money and that he will sell him his, his Toyota for $5,000. They go in the house and Pete gives Jim $5,000 and Jim hands Pete the keys and the title to his 1982 Toyota out back instead. The agreement is technically correct, but is a deception as Pete intended to buy the new Toyota and not the old one. Deception makes it an unconscionable contract. The next element necessary for a lawful contract is valuable consideration has to be exchanged. An example of this is Pete hands Jim $5,000, which is valuable assets, in exchange for the new Toyota, which is valuable assets. A promise to pay is a valuable asset. If you don't believe me, consider every time you give someone a check from your bank that is a promise to pay and not payment, because the check isn't money, is it? It's a promise to pay and they accept that as payment. No businessman ever returns the check as not being acceptable consideration. The third element of a lawful contract is that there has to be two wet ink signatures on the contract. This is the evidence of offer and acceptance and makes the parties liable to be sued. If you don't sign the contract, can you be sued? The case becomes very weak for the party suing. In a verbal contract, both sides agree verbally, but once one party signs for it to be equal, the other party also has to sign. The signature is the evidence of full commercial liability. I mean, you can't deny you put your name to it when it's a wet ink signature, can you? Let's discuss another element of doing business, the element of honor and dishonor. In honor and dishonor, which is as old as time, there these are maxims of law that apply to commerce. A maxim is a truth that holds true 100% of the time. If you are 
accused of something, it is your job to refute it or agree with it. If you fail to speak, you agree with the accusation. I mean, if you're in court and the man next to you is accusing you, says you murdered my brother, and you don't respond to that, it's assumed that it's your duty to respond and protect yourself and defend yourself, and if you don't respond, you're guilty. In honor and dishonor, the party sends you something that is accusatory, such as a lawsuit claiming you have injured him or breached a contract, and you become in dishonor if you don't respond. To stay in honor, you have to respond. Let's give an example of this. The credit card company sends you a statement and requests you pay the statement because it alleges you have a debt of $1,200. If you agree with this, you are happy with the contract and you send in the payment to set off the minimum amount due, everything's in harmony. But if you disagree with the presentment or offer, it's because it's an offer, which is what the statement is, in fact, you can remain in honor by responding with an offer or presentment of your own. Let's say you send in a declaration that you believe you owe $1,050 and not $1,200 and would like them to validate their statement that you owe $1,200. This is like a game of tennis. They hit one to you and you hit one back. Now the ball is in their court. They become in dishonor if they do not respond to your letter. And if they don't respond, then it must be true that you owe them $1,050. The concept of failure to speak equals lose is simple, and we see it in court every day as evidenced by a failure to appear equals you lose. If you're supposed to show up and you fail to appear, the judgment is against you every time. You, it's not sometimes it's against you, it's against you every time. Once you have failed to appear or failed to rebut the accusation, you lose the right to rebut the accusation in the future because you've dishonored the court and the accusation. Judgment is final. Unless you can show an element of fraud was involved in the process, and then the fraud would overturn every action that occurs after the fraud. So the credit card company will send you another statement showing all the purchases you have made, hoping you will accept them as proof of your indebtedness to them and you will continue to pay them. This is the administrative remedy we are showing. It is the process of doing business and the making and documenting of evidence to substantiate your position to get justice. Now let's look at a few maxims of law. One, quote, an unrebutted affidavit stands as truth. In this one, it is simply stating that a party's sworn testimony, if it goes unobjected to, is adjudged to be the truth. And not only if it goes unobjected to, but the only way to counter your sworn testimony is with more sworn testimony. So the opposing side has to sign an affidavit. Otherwise, if they're not swearing to something, you're not on equal footing anymore, and sworn testimony is more powerful than unsworn testimony every time. If you state that your next door neighbor's car is yours and have an affidavit drawn up with that stated on it, will it make it so? No. Why? Because the neighbor can ignore your rantings because you are not in contract with him and there is no agreements between you, so he does not have to recognize you. The credit card company, the IRS, the court system, the mortgage company, etc., all have agreements or contracts with you and as such are bound by law to have to respond to your rantings. But, in, but a private individual with no agreements with you does not. We have to go back to our childhood and remember the rules of engagement. When one kid says, quote, you're a dummy head, that is the offer. And the correct response is, quote, I know you are, but what am I? There is the acceptance and return offer. Like tennis, the ball is back in their court, and failure to, to respond makes it true. And we see that go on and on and on until someone gets tired of responding, right? Another maxim of law is that, quote, he who leaves the field of battle first loses. And as children, we get that. And we get that when we were kids. Another maxim of law is that, quote, truth is sovereign in commerce. And what does sovereign mean? Sovereign means king or highest power. So truth is the highest power and is superior to lies and deceit. 